Well, if you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 1. And note that we're starting a new sermon series in the book of Philippians where we will be for the rest of the summer. And the title of this series is Have This Mind in You. That comes from Philippians 2.5 in the hymn on Christ's humility. Paul says there, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So much of what we're going to learn in the book of Philippians in these coming two months will point out Christ, the goodness of Christ, and what he has done for us, and remind us of the fact that our spiritual maturity can only come when we are rooted in Christ. We will only grow in the faith when we are in Christ, and we'll see that this morning as well. With that, I'll read our text, Philippians 1, 1 through 11. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Church, we need true friends and true fellowship. When we think we do and when we think we can get by without it, trust me that you need true friends and true fellowship. Whether you've got good reasons or bad reasons at this time in your life to think otherwise, you need true friends and true fellowship more than you can realize. The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, is the first film in the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, which was obviously based on a book written by J.R.R. Tolkien back in the 20th century. And it chronicles this diverse group of men, these dwarves, elves, and hobbits, who are banding together to save Middle-earth from evil Sauron by destroying the one ring that rules them all in the fires of Mordor. And at the center of this journey, if you've ever seen the movie, is Frodo. He's this young hobbit who has to be the ring bearer to take this ring to Mordor and throw it in the fires there. He's tasked with holding on to the ring until it can be destroyed. And this journey is going to be a dangerous one, not only because of the land they have to traverse, but because of the weight he has to bear in carrying this one ring that can rule them all. So he's given several friends to help him there on this journey, but none are as close to him as Samwise Gamgee. Sam, as you watch this movie or read the books, proves invaluable to Frodo many times during the course of the story. I'm sure many of you have seen the movies or read the books, and at one point, Boromir has been killed by the orcs, the fellowship of these heroes has been broken apart, and there's this desperate moment where Frodo thinks he's a threat to his friends, and that he thinks he can spare their lives by going to Mordor alone. So he leaves the safety of his friends, and he makes his way onto a boat, and he is intent to make this journey by himself. But he can't shake Samwise Gamgee. As Frodo's trying to get away on this boat, Sam chases him down. Frodo, no, Frodo, Frodo. And Frodo tells him, no, Sam, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. And Sam tells him, of course you are, and I'm coming with you. And at this point, it's clear that Sam can't swim as he's in these waters, and his, his head is going below water, and Frodo is screaming for him to stop. And he finally goes under. It seems that his death is imminent until Frodo goes back to him, pulls him from the water, and saves him. And once he comes to, Sam tells him, I made a promise, Mr. Frodo, a promise. Don't you leave him, Samwise Gamgee. 
And I don't mean to. I don't mean to. And at the end of the trilogy, about six hours later, if you watch these movies, it's Samwise there with Frodo as the ring is destroyed. And we know at that point in the movie that Frodo would have never made it there without Sam. These are the kinds of friendships that the Christian life can lead us to, that it's supposed to lead us to. This is the kind of friendship it seemed Paul and the Philippians had as we read this letter. You've probably already seen it in these first 11 verses. If Paul was going to traverse the land to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Philippians were going to be his Samwise Gamgee. This church at Philippi was the first church Paul founded in Europe in Acts 16. He had likely visited them since planning the church, but since then, he's ended up in prison, likely in Rome. And not only that, but it seems as we read this letter that Paul knows that his death is imminent, that he's about to be killed for the fact that he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This might be the last word that the church at Philippi ever got from Paul. It could be considered a missionary support letter. He's writing to those who have supported his work and helped made it happen. So Paul is fulfilling his end of the deal as the missionary church planner. He assures them of his prayers for them. He upstate them on his circumstances. He reports of the gospel ministry in that area and what he's done so far. He offers encouragements and he expresses gratitude for their support in the ministry. But others have called it simply a friendship letter. It's not written out of obligation or duty, the way many missionaries feel they have to send letters to their supporters. It's written instead out of love for these recipients. Paul's love, we're going to see, is evident. He cares deeply about these people. J.B. Lightfoot says the thanksgiving in this letter is more than usually earnest. The apostle dwells long and fondly on the subject. I've served in five churches now in some ministerial capacity, and if you ask me my favorite, I'm willing to say it's whatever church I'm serving in right now. Pastors don't want to get into these comparisons games, but I think if you had asked Paul his favorite church, he would have said, without hesitation, Philippi, 100%. Paul, what about Galatia, Ephesus, Colossae, Corinth? Philippi, 100%. That's my favorite church. I've wondered if there's some awkwardness when this letter was probably circulated to some of the other churches. Imagine the Galatians. Paul had just written to them, I'm astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who has called you in the grace of Christ. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And here he is telling Philippi, I hold you in my heart. I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. We have here a clear thankfulness in Paul for these people. And why is he thankful? Why does he love them so much? Well, that's the central idea of this whole passage. Paul loved the church in Philippi for three reasons. They were his pals, they were his partners, and they were fellow partakers of God's grace. So I've creatively titled this sermon, Pals, Partners, and Partakers. As pals, they had mutual love. They had a great affection for each other. As partners, they had mutual activity, a great work with each other. And as fellow partakers, they had a mutual grace from God himself, the salvation that only God can give. Church, our fellowship and friendship with each other, brothers and sisters, with other brothers and sisters in the faith, it exists for the same reasons. In the church, like nowhere else, we should have a mutual affection for one another because God has made us pals, partners, and partakers. So that's where I plan to take us today to see what it means to be each of these things and what it might look like to be and do them well. In the church, we're pals, partners, and partakers. So first, let's look at what it means that we're pals. These people make Paul joyful, verses 3 and 4. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Paul says that every time he remembers the Philippians, he thanks God. And we don't read this as as if every single prayer that God prayed, he always made sure to add a little subtext of the Philippians in there. Instead, it's that every prayer he prays for the Philippians, he's saying it's always a prayer for joy, and it's out of joy. These people are putting a smile on Paul's face when he thinks of them and prays for them. Hopefully you have your person as well, one that brings you joy. 
And if you're married, I'm not talking about your spouse or your kids, though I do hope they bring you joy. I'm talking about the person on Sundays, maybe even this Sunday, that you can't wait to see because it is such a joy to be around them. When you think of them, it's joy. When you pray for them, it's joy. The person who encourages you and edifies you, the person who has stood by you, the person who loves you for you and not just what you can give them. The person who, if they're not here, your day already feels a little more cloudy. It's a blessing from God to have people like that in our lives. Like it did for Paul, if you have that person or persons, let it produce prayer in your life. This is where Paul's joy for them takes him. Do you see the cycle? Paul remembers them, and then he thanks God for them. And then he makes a prayer of thanks with joy, and that joy continues to swell in his heart, and that joy likely causes him to remember them again, which turns him right back to prayer. It's as Walter Hansen put it in that quote on the front of your bulletin. Every remembrance of his friends moves him to pray urgently for their needs. Every urgent request for them includes giving thanks to God for them. Giving thanks to God for his friends fills his heart with joy. It's a gift from God to have a friend like this. I sympathize with a job explanation I heard a few weeks ago. Asking someone what they do for a living as we normally do. He said, I'm a professional emailer. And I I feel like that sometimes too, always aiming to get my inbox to zero. But to do that, I have to weed through emails pretending to be personal that are not. You know the ones, dear Mr. Moore. I already know this isn't a guy that I know if he's referring to me as dear Mr. Moore. Or dear brackets, insert name, if the automations don't kick in and and tell me this message is actually for me. And then there's a few paragraphs in there of why I matter so much to them, just to ask for my money, or to buy some product or make some new subscription. We, We don't care about these false affections, pretend friendships. We don't want to be pandered to. We want the real thing. And that's what Paul and the Philippians have. How wonderful to be the kind of person of whom it can be said, I thank my God every time I think of you. When your name runs through my mind, it produces joy in my heart. And we get that in the church, or we should be getting that in the church. These people make Paul joyful, and he loves them for it. These people also give Paul confidence, and that makes them even truer friends. Verse 6, look at what Paul says. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Where the ESV says sure in verse 6, the New American Standard says more helpfully, I think, confident. Paul is confident at the work in the Philippians' lives and that God is going to see them through the end. A true believer can have many friends and family members, acquaintances, co-workers, neighbors, etc. But it is other believers who are our truest friends. Because it's other believers who share the greatest thing in common with us. Salvation now and eternal life later. C.S. Lewis said that friendships are discovered when you say, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. Friendships are typically based on something we have in common. Tony Morita says that gospel friendships are much deeper because there is a you too that's radically deeper. We share a common savior. We are united in one spirit, and we are headed for eternal life together. Guys, how sweet is it that friendship with our friends who believe and live in such a way that we can be confident of their future? We know this is someone I'm going to see on the other side of this life. And our hearts ache for those that we can't say this about. Sometimes it's all we can think about, even when we're around them. Paul's friendship is so strong because he's assured and confident. These will be my friends for eternity. They're not a perfect church, as we'll see in just a few chapters, but they are a healthy church. And that makes Paul all the more glad to call them his pals and his friends. It's no wonder then that Paul longs to be with them in person. These people are with Paul, he says in verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. He wants to see them face to face, but in the meantime, he writes, I hold you in my heart. Maybe better translated as, I have you in my heart, or there's a special place in my heart for you. 
Christians, we were made for community. The only not good statement made in the Garden of Eden is the fact that Adam was alone. Like our triune God, one God in three persons, we need community to express the love that God has called us to. As I worked on this sermon, one song got stuck in my head because of this verse. Phil Collins, you'll be in my heart. And as an aside, I just want to say that Phil Collins went way harder on that Tarzan soundtrack than I think anybody ever expected him to. Here's an excerpt from You'll Be In My Heart. Don't listen to them, because what do they know? We need each other to have to hold. They'll see in time, I know. When destiny calls you, you must be strong. I may not be with you, but you've got to hold on. They'll see in time, I know. We'll show them together, because you'll be in my heart. Phil Collins knew that people need each other physical, embodied presence to have and to hold. But that when we can't, at least, to be in one another's hearts was a good enough substitute. Sweet lyrics, but they don't even begin to touch the extent to which Paul and the Philippians cared for each other. Even though physically apart, Paul felt that he and they were actually together. That's how much they meant to him. You're always in my heart. R.P. Martin says here that Paul was vividly conscious of being present with his converts, even when he was physically separated from them. And this metaphor, I have you in my heart, is the most imaginative metaphor in all of Paul's writings. It's this phrase, matched with partaker of grace, that is so astonishing. There is a deep sense of oneness, even though distance separates them. And even more than this desire to be with them, Paul's affection, his love for them is beyond measure. These people, Paul loves. And as I said earlier, maybe loves them the most. To express how much he cares for his friends, he uses the name of God in verse 8. He says, for God is my witness, how I yearn with you, for you, all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul appeals to God's name for the confirmation they need to know how much he loved them. That's not something you do unless you really mean it. It's what I used to hear on the playground. I, I swear on my mama's grave. Paul is saying, God is my witness. This is how great my affection is for you. Paul really did love these people. He wanted to be with them. When Paul says yearning, what he's trying to say is that he misses this church. In Paul's eyes, this is an easy church to love. When he thinks of his love for him, it's comparable even to the affection that Christ Jesus has for his people. Paul says it's the root of his love. But church, the good news is this, that God loves us even when we are not easy to love. Thankfully, his love is not circumstantial or dependent on us. Paul might even call the Philippians fools one day, just like he did the Galatians, because his love is only human. But God's love is not circumstantial, and God's love will never fail. So as we come to understand Paul's joy for and his confidence in and his desire to be together and his affection for this people, it's all pointing to the one who does it better than anyone else. God himself. He is our truest friend. And our friendship with him is the one that every good and earthly friendship points to. So practically, how might you be a better friend to others? How can you move beyond surface level relationship to the real thing? Something that makes you talk like Paul talked here. Well, don't just be a pal. Maybe be a pen pal. There is nothing, I think, more joyful during a day at work or a long day at home, than to open your mailbox and get a handwritten letter from someone you care about. Someone who took the time needed to think about you, to write a letter to you to show that they care. Like Paul did for his own friends in Philippi, may you write letters to your friends. You can practice hospitality. We're not prohibited, like Paul was here, to be with others face to face. And as you do it, learn their stories. Ask them to share their testimonies. It's hard to be thankful and to have joy for what God has done in their lives if you don't know what God has done in their lives. And it's hard to have that you too moment that C.S. Lewis talks about until we talk to each other in this way. You can also be here. You're here now, and that's good, and I'm thankful, but really, you can choose to be all in here. Go out of your way to be with God's people. And take time to get to know God's people. Come early, stay late, and find true fellowship in the church. 
depend on, and hold one another accountable. Dig deeper, plant yourself, get rooted, and don't walk through life alone. If you've been considering membership but haven't taken that next step, let me encourage you that I personally think on earth there's probably nothing better for your spiritual health outside of God's spirit than to covenant with and care for God's people in church membership. The fellowship and friendship that Paul and the Philippians share is multiplied by the next two points. They were so close because they were also partners in the work of the gospel. From the beginning until now, Paul says in verse 5, these people have partnered with him. Verse 5, your partnership in the gospel is from the first day until now. This Greek word used for partnership is one you may have heard before. Koinonia is most often translated as fellowship. And the older I get, the more churches I see that are calling themselves Koinonia Church to emphasize the centrality of fellowship in the Christian life. But what is true Christian fellowship? When Paul uses this word, he's trying to say that there is something shared about what they're doing. It's a term that conveys a sense of commonality, solidarity, and shared responsibility. The persistence of this partnership cannot be taken too lightly. Paul makes a point to say that this partnership has existed from the first day until now. So he's thinking back to when they first believed in Acts 16. And we don't have time to turn there and read that whole story, but I encourage you to do it sometime this week just to get yourself in the mindset of what's happening here in Philippi. The Spirit leads Paul to Philippi and through him, work saving miracles in the lives of Lydia and the Philippian jailer. They believed the gospel, and Paul thanks God for that. And like Paul, it seems they're likely spreading the gospel as well. This was the first church in Europe and probably a hub for spreading the gospel to other churches in Europe. Almost immediately after she believed, Lydia offers the hospitality of her home to others, and the jailer is washing his prisoner's wounds. They've gotten to work, and they were still working up until this point. But it becomes clear later in Philippians that their partnership comes primarily in the form of financial support for Paul. This is what Paul mentions in Philippians 4, 15 through 16. He says, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. They had clearly continued to support Paul in his ongoing work. And how amazing is it that Paul says, you are a partner in my work if you're doing that. Have you thought about your missions giving in such a way? Even though you're not out there in the 1040 window sharing the gospel in one of the hardest contexts of the world, if you are giving of your resources and stewarding what God has given you for the sake of that work, Paul would tell you, you're a partner in that work. You're sharing with me in this work. Paul's language of partnership implies experiencing the difficulty with Paul. He's saying, if I'm laboring, you're laboring. If I'm suffering, you're suffering. If I'm in chains, so are you. They're participators with Paul in his experience of defending and confirming the gospel, and they don't care if he's in prison or out of prison. They'll keep doing it. They are committed together to make sure the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, gets to the nations. And they did this not out of wealth, but out of sacrifice, which is another point of application for us. This partnership cost them. 2 Corinthians 8.2 says, Their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. And not only have they continued to partner with Paul, but they did it through thick and thin. Verse 7 says, it's both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel that they've partnered with him. They did not forget their brother when he was persecuted. They did not forget their brother when he was suffering in chains behind bars. When it was hardest to press on, they pressed on. They stood with Paul through his ministry to defend and confirm the gospel. As verse 7 says, Paul's ministry was one of defending the faith against false gospels and confirming the one true gospel, yet it was doing this that often led Paul to be behind bars. So the Philippians said, we're going to stand with you, whether in prison or out, in every season, and as you continue 
to remain in this defense and confirmation ministry, we're going to be there. Paul even says in Philippians 1.18, In every way, even in prison, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. The mission had not stopped. If you put Paul on a boat, if you put him behind bars, if you put him in chains before the courts, he was going to preach Christ. And the Philippians thought that was worth supporting. The fact that they've remembered him in this hardest moment strengthened the extent of their friendship. And it strengthened Paul's thankfulness that he could count them as friends. Their partnership is not just one of attitude and words. It's a partnership of action. It's a friendship of action. They're not just telling Paul they're with him. You're in our thoughts and prayers. They're actually doing things to show that they are with him. Paul commends them here, not for abstract support, platitudes about how they're with him in his darkest days. He's commending them because they've actually remained by his side. Our fellowship with one another has to move beyond mere socialization. Fellowship is not just drinking coffee or playing golf together. Great things, please do them, but that cannot be where fellowship ends. We fellowship in the common mission of getting the gospel to the nations. Through Christ, we are friends and co-workers with other believers. Just a few weeks ago, I was encouraged by a member of ours who asked me if I knew of any missionaries or Christian families currently directly impacted by the war in Gaza and Israel. This member said he had been seeing, obviously, updates in the news and hearing of horrible accounts and wanted to do something more than pray. So he just asked me, if he wants to help financially, who's the person to give that money to? Out of all the online fundraisers, he just wanted to know the best one so he could tangibly partner with those working in a difficult situation. I would love to get 10 more texts like that this coming week. Do what you can to partner with other believing workers around the world, and in that, your Christian friendships will only grow as you stick with them through thick and thin. Last, before they could become pals and partners, they had to each become partakers of divine grace. And Paul ends on this note, as should we. We're not only pals, we're not only partners, we are fellow partakers of God's grace. Another way of putting this is that we are all recipients of God's grace. That grace is experienced in a multitude of ways. We're primarily partakers of God's special saving grace. Verse 7 says, You are all partakers with me of grace. Paul is saying God has saved us. Paul and the Philippians share the special favor of God. As Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 put it, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. The grace and peace that come only from God are theirs as well. So Paul calls them the saints who were at Philippi at the beginning of this book. The grace they are partakers of is the grace that comes only from God. This is a letter written to God's holy people. This is the amazing grace that we sing of, that God might save a wretch like me. Every membership class we teach through our church's Confession of Faith, which is adapted from the New Hampshire Confession of Faith from 1853. And I love what it says in the article of God's Purpose of Grace. It says that our election in Christ is a most glorious display of God's sovereign goodness, being infinitely free, wise, holy, and unchangeable, that it utterly excludes boasting and promotes humility, love, prayer, praise, trust in God, an active imitation of his free mercy. We cannot remind ourselves enough of this saving grace in our lives, that we are partakers of divine grace. Paul also prays that as partakers, that their partaking may increase, that the grace that saved them is also that which produces good in them. Saving grace is sanctifying grace. In verses 9 through 11, that's what Paul is trying to show us. This is Paul's prayer, what he's been joyfully praying for his dear friends. 
He wants their love, verse 9, to abound more and more. Love for God and love for one another, as Jesus said in Matthew 22. And this love would be accompanied by knowledge and discernment. Not only would their love grow, but their knowledge would grow. And as their knowledge grew, Paul prayed that the application of that knowledge would prove itself in discernment. That they would have the depth of insight to know how to live for the Lord. And in doing this, Paul says, you'll be more and more able to approve that which is excellent. They'll be able to determine what matters most in this life. As we grow old, our partaking in God's grace is revealed and confirmed as we increasingly affirm and practice that which is excellent. We start to let go of things that don't matter as life goes on so that we can grip tightly to the things that do. The thought here is that if they do the first things, then this will follow. If love is growing, then the prayer is that knowledge and discernment grow with it. And if your love is growing and knowledge and discernment, Paul says, it will lead you to approve and do what is excellent. Philippians 4.8 came to my mind as I read this, which we're going to study later this summer. There Paul writes, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely... Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is how the Christian life is marked. A pursuit of that which is excellent. Whatever we do in life, whatever we give ourselves to, may we be able to say that it's that which is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. It, it would not be the worst idea if sometime this week you sat down and just had a thought process, assessed your life, and determined those things that do not fit into one of these categories and work to rid yourself of them. I don't think you'd have a day of regret if you did that. In this, Paul prays, that they might be pure and blameless. He wanted them to be found in Christ and without offense if Christ came back. The idea here is that of the inner and outer life. It's character, who you are when nobody's watching, and it's reputation, who you are when others are watching. We don't divorce these two. A lot of people try to do that. They throw reputation out and say character is all that matters. Paul is saying both matter. We don't divorce these. We aim for both. And this, he says, will lead to the fruit of righteousness. It will lead to the fruit of salvation. Rooted in Christ, you will start to produce what is expected for Christians to produce. And it's a fruit of righteousness because it proceeds from the righteousness that is given to us in salvation. It's not that the fruit is what gives us a righteous standing before God. Paul's already made clear that they are saints. They are holy people in God's eyes because of Christ. The fruit is not what makes us righteous, so we can't confuse this. This is a request for Christ himself, as it is through him that we get this fruit. And that's why Paul says in the end here, all glory and praise go to God. The Fruit of the Spirit song is a popular one in my house right now, thanks to Vacation Bible School. I'm sure it's the same with many of you other parents. And I'm glad, because now my kids know the Fruit of the Spirit is not a banana, watermelon, coconut, or grape. It's Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When J.D. was teaching on the fruit of the Spirit during VBS a couple weeks ago, I thought he used a fitting illustration. One morning with the kids, he brought out some sticks that he had obviously pulled from his yard with different fruits duct taped to them to prove a point about what fruit trees do not look like. Unfortunately, the Christian life sometimes looks like this, or at least people try to make it seem this way. They think the goal is simply to add all the fruit of the Spirit to our lives like duct taping lemons to a stick. But that's not how fruit is produced. That is not the key. If you're an unbeliever with us today, number one, we're glad that you're here. But I really want you to hear this, that the fruit of righteousness is not a checklist. Paul here is not giving us a to-do list and saying, make sure you throw all the fruit in your lives. The key is to abide in the Savior, Jesus Christ, and then the fruit will come. The fruit of righteousness only comes from union with the king of righteousness. What Paul's praying for here is not instantaneous then. If you've ever planted a seed in the ground and and hoped that a tree would grow to, to bear fruit, you don't just sit there and watch it. You know that it takes time. It's not instantaneous. 
but it is increasing and it is progressive. If you plant a seed in the ground and you don't see anything a year later, you might have done something wrong. This is why we are referred to as spiritual babies and children in Scripture. Have you ever tried to watch a child learn to walk and talk and become self-sufficient? I've been watching for five years now. We're still not there. It's not like gazelles and giraffes that are running 10 minutes after they exit the womb. Human babies have to grow up slowly over time and with much patience. That's the Christian life. It's not instantaneous, but Lord willing, it is increasing and it's progressing. So we can't be too hard on ourselves or others. That's why I think with even the hard letters Paul had to write, he still showed love for these people as they were growing in Christ. The question, church, is not, have I arrived? You will never arrive in this lifetime. The question is, instead, am I progressing? Is my saving grace that I claim proving to be a sanctifying grace in my life as well? If not, Paul would say elsewhere, there's reason to examine and test yourself. Am I being conformed to the image of his son from one degree of glory to another? As partakers of grace, Paul confirms that God will see us through. He will keep his people and hold them fast. Remember, Paul's already said he's confident of this very thing. Verse 6, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Not only have they been solid partners from the first day until now, but here Paul looks into the future and he is assured and he is assuring them that they will have this work of grace completed when Christ returns. God will do it. He will keep his grip and bring this work to a completion. If you think Paul loves these people, I want you to think about how much more the Lord loves them. If you have a friend who loves you in this way, think about how much more the Lord loves you. Think about how much more he loves them. We often sing the song, He Will Hold Me Fast here at Grace Bible Church. If I had had the foresight, I could have worked it into today's service, but still, I think these lyrics, even if just read, are a comforting reminder to us of what God is doing, what he has done, and what he will do in our lives. It says, those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. One day, church, the work will finally be finished. Our confidence in this comes not from ourselves, but from God who finishes what he starts and does not leave us to fend for ourselves. Be thankful, church, that here among God's people that this will happen for you. And be thankful that you have pals, partners, and partakers to do it with you. And do whatever you can to abide in Christ, ensuring that you'll continue in this way for the rest of your life. Let's pray. God, again, we thank you so much for your word. 